first of all, welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, I'm Patrick Hewitt and I head uh, MoFo's US private equity practice. Uh, our private equity group and our ESG teams work very closely together and are true partners uh, within our firm. And so I'm especially pleased to be moderating this conversation about the integration of ESG in private equity. I also want to start off by thanking Environmental Resource Management or ERM uh, for co-hosting uh, this webinar with us. Um, so with that, I'll invite our, the, the most important people here to introduce themselves on our panel. And I'll start with uh, Faisal Khan, who's our co-host from ERM. Thanks, thanks, Patrick, and great to be with everyone today. Uh, so Faisal Khan, I lead our finance sector practice uh, in ERM. I work extensively with PE firms uh, on everything sustainability from, from due diligence engagements through ESG integration, sustainable financings, and also the reporting aspects of sustainability. So great to be here. Great, thank you. Madeline, do you wanna introduce yourself? Yes, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Madeline. I work in Generation Investment Management as the director across our private equity strategies, both our growth strategy and long-term strategy. I have three primary responsibility areas. Uh, one is around investment process, identifying, uh, predicting, kind of responding to regulatory needs, uh, impact measurement, monitoring, reporting, and client engagement around that, and also portfolio stewardship and engagement with our portfolio on key areas we can have high leverage and accelerating their impact under our, our stewardship. Great, thank you for joining us. Uh, Andrew? Thank you, Patrick, and uh, to the MoFo team for including me today. It's a pleasure to be here with you all and such a great group of panelists. Um, my name is Andrew Hughes. I'm a principal on the capital markets team at Generate Capital, where I focus on capital formation, corporate financial and ESG strategy and investor relations. Great, thank you. And Rick? Great, thanks Patrick and thank you to MoFo and ERM for having me on the panel. I am um, currently a senior advisor at, uh, at TBG helping on climate and energy investing. It started off as the uh, sector lead for energy investing in the multi-sectoral RISE fund, a large impact fund and then helped to raise the uh, RISE Climate Fund last year. And we're focused on making investments, growth equity investments in companies having demonstrable impact, where I'm particularly focused on climate and energy. Great, thanks, Rick. And Jason. Sorry, I was on mute. Uh, hi there, good morning, everyone. And thanks, Mofo and ERM, for inviting me. Um, so I'm a lawyer in the legal and regulatory department of Tomasi. Uh, and I work with the ESG folks in uh, the team on various areas, including the investment management process, um, horizon scanning and rent change management, uh, capacity building, and also on the ESG governance of the portfolio companies. Uh, so I'm very happy to be here. Thank you. Great, right, thank And Suze. Thanks, Patrick, and uh, good morning. Um, really pleased to be on the panel. I'm Susan McCormick. I'm a partner in San Francisco. I do growth equity deals, but I also lead our impact and ESG practice at the firm. Relevance for this, um, I, I teach on the topic at Berkeley Law um, as a founding board member of SASB and on the boards of BSR and Series, and I was one of the drafters of the SBC that became the PBC that people refer to as B Corp, so the, the new corporate forms integrating ESG into the governance structure. Great. Um, well, thank you all uh, for being here. Maybe you know the topic of this call that everybody knows is to you know how to integrate ESG into PE investments. And so maybe we'll start with a pretty basic question uh, for the whole group. Um, you know, is ESG considerations are now a means of leveraging attention and valuation. So you know, what should funds consider and focus on when building in ESG as a factor into their investment decisions, whether that's on the front end with deal selection or diligence or the execution process with definitive documentation or post-closing uh, integration tracking? I know that's a big question, but maybe we can just start with uh, some initial thoughts on, on that sort of basic integration. And maybe Rick, I'll go to you just to kick us off. Put you on the spot. Sure, um, thanks. thanks Patrick. Love being put on the spot. Um, now, my sense is uh, it, it's clear that ESG has taken on a much more prominent role in how investors are thinking about investing these days. Part of that's now driven by, you know, the shift to more, more compliance mechanisms. 
Um, but there's also been a number of um, you know uh, ways of doing this or or um, forums to do this. I think there's a bit of a you know as investors approach this, there are a bit of table stakes on this. Uh, what all investors should do, and it's just thinking about how a company does its business um, and keeping them aligned with a number of the ESG principles. Um, that's all three of those: environmental, social, and governance. Um, and depending on the fund that you're in or what investment manager you're in, there's things that you might want to do that go beyond just kind of those table stakes. But some of the table stakes are really just, it started off a bit as a risk mitigant, right? You don't want a company going and doing things that don't no longer give them a license to operate in, in some places. So that could be how they deal with their communities. It could be, um, you know, their environmental and supply chain exposure. Um, but it's also how they you know, think about the business itself, their, you know, diversity, inclusion, talent, and things like that. Um, I know Susan team has spent a, a bunch of time delving into these uh, topics and helping clients on them. I, I think it's just helpful overall to help to make sure the companies that you invest in know that you'll be assessing and continuing to measure some of these performance characteristics over time, not just the investment, um, you know, financial results. Um, and that, that due to some of these increased compliance requirements, but it's also partly to ensure the funds are meeting their commitments to whether it's ESG principles or net zero, I think we're going to talk a little bit about, um, but just making sure that it's incorporated into this whole deal life cycle. Um, so identifying opportunities, doing the diligence, and that part of that's the risk understanding, but how a company approaches business. And then post-closing, um, you know, we, we continue to assess and measure performance along these metrics um, to help the companies too. There's also, there's a risk part of this. There's also an opportunity aspect to it with ESG and, and climate now top of mind for many investors. There's, sometimes there's a, this is a lens that can provide access to opportunities for companies too. So that shouldn't be lost in this, oh my gosh, I gotta go you know, measure a bunch more new, new things. So that's a, a quick sense of it. I know everyone else probably has an opinion too. I think the one thing that stands out to, to me, in addition to sort of the, the rapid rise in popularity, we'll say it, of, of ESG over the last two, three years, is the opportunity to codify a lot of what Rick's, Rick's talking about in some definitive documentation um, around deal making, around portfolio companies, whether that's in the corporate charter, uh, whether that is, you know, a, a green financing piece of paper or a sustainability linked bond or revolver, things like that, there's there's real legal documentation that now supports a lot of these aims. Um, and I think adds a lot of uh, teeth to these types of issues. Um, I'll just add two things to what uh, Rick and Andrew have said. Um, I think it's key also to have um, capacity building uh, to create within the institution itself uh, awareness of the um, ESG developments. Um, so I think this is something at least we're doing a lot of work uh, in Tamase. Uh, in addition to that, it's also um, key to have or embed uh, ESG matrix and uh, goals, which you know we can monitor on an asset on portfolio basis, just to measure how we're doing in terms of progress. Um, and I'll just round it up you know, to reinforce the point which uh, Rick mentioned. You know, we should look always as ESG, not just as a risk, uh, to be managed, but also opportunities and value uh, to be realized, right? And again, as uh, fund managers, which are whole portfolio of assets and companies, you can try and have cross synergies to try and actually increase the, the value. And that's where we see that's a, a lot of uh, opportunity, which I think is, is, is sometimes gets lost uh, in this whole discussion about ESG risks. And I'll just add one of one of the things that has happened is I, I, I've been in the space since 2001 and five years ago, a, you know, an asset manager might hire an advisor and kind of go skin deep on, you know, 15 or 20 different variables. And, you know, I, I love the, the sort of the, the B Corp certification to go you know, through 200 different factors. That's really not where the, the market is in terms of what the LPs want their GPs to do or how the GPs are looking at portfolio companies. It's really, at, you know, if you're, if you're like, you know, Tomasic, I'll pick on Jason for a second and you're already deep and you have built the capacity, you can do a deep dive in 20 areas. If you're new, I really advise you to pick a few and go deep and really go deep. So, you know, DEI, it's not just, you know, ticking the box on the numbers and diversity. It's really, you know, you know, do you have, you know, a, a way to evaluate and assess 
assessments of, you know, how people are evaluating their employees for retention promotion. And it's, it's much deeper. And obviously we'll talk a lot about climate. The one thing I want to just mention before Madeline ends us, which is don't forget about governance. Um, I mean, G was sort of there first. I think there's been a lot of focus on the E and the S. There has been a lot of evolution on governance and the, the correlation between governance and value has been, has been proven um, over a long period of time. I think we're now in very uncertain um, times in the, in the private and public capital markets. And if, you know, if you've got a really good, good people and a good idea and the markets are great, you may not have to worry about governance. It's going to go fine, but really good governance is designed for when things that you don't expect happen or when, <laughs> when there are a lot of variables outside of your control. And I think we will see, even within you know, fabulous companies, ESG, those that haven't focused as much on governance and their structure will probably you know, ha have some issues in the, in the coming months or a year. Melanie? Yeah, thank you so much. I mean, I agree with everything that's been said. And I guess to touch on perhaps it's kind of an obvious point, but the, the purpose of this is to think about why are we attending to ES or G issues and how do they ultimately drive performance in the sense of both financial returns, but also impact on the world. So for me, a critical factor here, or you know, what should we be focusing on is at what are the tools, processes, practices, conversations, attitudes that we need to actually develop alignment with each company that we invest in as to why we're doing this um, and how and why information on ESG and impact are actually, basically it's for management information and should be part of one's management systems because I think that's how we, we ultimately get the and a performance, whether that's on the financial or the impact side that we want to see. And maybe uh, just, just to add quickly, just from an operationalizing standpoint, I mean, a key aspect of this is to be able to do this consistently across sometimes large portfolios. So the ability to assess using, uh, you know, whether it's standardized criteria or metrics, and then also to gather information in an efficient and timely way and information that can be used to make investor grade sort of decisions is, is I mean, there's some key operational challenges associated with that. And we work with a lot of clients to, uh, you know, get firstly, get into that space, define uh, an early stage ambition, and then, you know, work up the maturity sort of continuum on being able to produce that uh, to use it, you know, uh, more effectively for for making decisions. So that that's, you know, that not, not something to be underestimated either. Uh, but it sort of brings all the pieces that, you know, you all described so well already together. Right. Thank you. Um, and one thing just for everybody uh, in the audience, why I neglected is that there is a Q&A uh, function uh, on the Zoom. If to extent there are questions, I will do my best to monitor that and, and, and raise those questions, although I, I make no guarantees uh, that we get through all of them. Um, so maybe, uh, Andrew, one thing, you know, you had mentioned about, um, embedding you know these things in in chart in charters and, and the opportunity to do that uh you come from a slightly different perspective than others on the panel but generate being a permanent capital vehicle as as some others may know like sequoia recently reverse engineered into this form and more funds are, are seem to be leaving the typical lpgp structure and so I was wondering if you could speak a little bit to sort of the why you know around uh generate deciding to go down the permanent capital structure and then what sort of advantages um, you've seen, you know, from that structure. Yeah, absolutely, Patrick. Um, so Generate is a sustainable infrastructure investment platform and operating company that we're structured as a public benefit corporation. So we're not actually a fund, we're a corporation and specifically a public benefit corporation. And I know we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about what that means. In terms of what we do day to day, you know, we invest in finance, build, own, and operate sustainable infrastructure across a variety of different sectors, uh, primarily in clean energy, transportation, waste, water, agriculture, uh, areas of the economy like that. And when we were founded in 2014 by a group of clean energy veterans, structure was top of mind. Um, and Generate was really purpose built from the ground up to provide a wide range of capital solutions to project developers and technology companies to accelerate the deployment of sustainable infrastructure on one hand. And then on the other hand, help customers uh, who you know, are a 
huge stakeholder for us, access more affordable, more resilient, and more sustainable energy or waste management solutions or other types of, of you know, services provided by more sustainable infrastructure. And so I think the common thread that you're, you're hearing there is really about the alignment of interests among different stakeholders. And there's a lot of different stakeholders in any infrastructure project. Uh, and I think that's something that can really best be accomplished through a vehicle that has a permanent and forever time horizon. Uh, and a vehicle that has the ability to provide the right type of capital at the right time for the right project and has the operational expertise to serve the end customer and can you know, set up incentive alignment across owners and employees and customers and partners and things like that. And you know, I think it, it does take a permanent capital structure uh, to be able to do that really effectively, right? Like if you know, we're, we're investing in and in owning and operating these projects that are 20, 25, 30 year assets and serving customers over that period of time, that customer wants to know who's going to be there in year five. And that's the same, you know, uh, provider in year 10 and then year 20. And that's how you build trust. And I, I think that's how you deploy a lot of what, you know, we need on the infrastructure side to, to really re rebuild the world. Um, so, you know, a lot of the advantages that we see for ourselves in the marketplace, I think, are a direct function of our structure as a permanent capital vehicle. Yeah, yeah I got it. And you mentioned um, also having being a public benefit corp itself. So so in in having that embedded in your your charter, um, you know, have your standards, did that alter the standards for uh, investment within Generate? Did it just sort of, you know, more propel you to the, the, the original mission, uh, maybe speak a little bit to the, the why behind that conversion and, and how it's affected the investment activity. Yeah, absolutely. I, you know, the, the short answer is that on a day-to-day -day basis, I think it's had very little change for um, what we do. Uh, the conversion to a, a PBC happened last year. And in some ways you could even argue that was a bit um, overdue, right? I mean, I, since our founding, the vision has really been to, build a more sustainable world and align the incentives of all the, the stakeholders, you know, some of what I was talking about in, in the first answer. And the conversion to a PBC, I think, really reinforced that mission. Um, and so, as I said, day to day, you know, we continue in terms of what we do and in, in terms of what our standards are, in terms of what we're investing in, areas of the market that we're operating, um, you know, day to day, very little change, you know, on the Obviously, you know, there, there are implications for being a PBC and our board of directors, you know, has a mandate now to balance the economic interests of, of shareholders and the material interests of all the other stakeholders that I was describing who are affected by what we do and, and how we carry out our, our public benefit. Um, you know, and there's some important reporting requirements that go along with that as well. Um, so I, I don't mean to diminish it. I, it's a big, big step, I think, for the company. Uh, but in terms of, of what we do every day, uh, I would say very little change. And, yeah. and if I could just add, just because I was a little involved in, in this process for Generate, it's interesting. This is the first time, and Generate is a trailblazer that a lot of the large pension funds um, were invested in Generate and had to do an analysis as to whether they could be, if they were legally mandated to be returned first, could they be investing in a PVC? And a little later in the program, I'll, I can go through the analysis when I talk about the different forms. And so for them, not as much change other than with, you know, the, the PVC has dual fiduciary duties. Um, and that was a challenge for the pension funds. They ended up getting comfortable, but it's only because of this, how we, how we crafted the public purpose for, for generate. Yeah. yeah. And I guess, I mean, taking on that, you know, now that you've done that it, to the extent you can speak to it, have you, have you seen an, an uptick in investment interest? How are investors overall reacting or the investing world, you know, responding to the PBC structure and, you know, I guess under what circumstances have you found um, it really does help and, and maybe, maybe where is it a little bit more challenging? Yeah, that's no, a great question. I, it, it was received very, very positively um, by our shareholder base. Um, and, you know, these, as, as Suze mentioned, are very long-term oriented, deep-pocketed investors that want to keep supporting the growth of the business. And so getting their buy-in obviously was, was crucial. Um, the conversion doesn't happen without that. Uh, but the enthusiasm they had for it, the support they had for it, I think um, was, was pretty remarkable, frankly. Uh, and as Susan alluded to, I think a lot of that has to do with the alignment of the purpose, the public benefit purpose, and 
you know, the way that generate makes a profit and earns cash flow, right? It's, it's very much aligned. And I think that is a key, a key feature to, you know, having a successful conversion and, and uh, having the public benefit corporation structure be a, a big part of, you know, positive reception in, in capital markets among investors. Right. Right. Nice. Um, thank you. I get, think Rick, maybe turn to you. You had mentioned in, in your kind of opening remarks to the sort of increase in popularity, as you put it in, in, in ESG now, um, you know, you, and I believe you used to head energy investment at Google and maybe would love sort of the broader perspective from you and your experience investing in climate before, you know, this sort of current boom. And, and then obviously now within TPG, kind of where it's come. Sure. Sure. Thanks, Patrick. Um, I'd say the shorthand version is there are different types of investing. One is at Google and where I am at TPG, but there's some, there's very much a thread line of similarity and purpose. So while I was at Google, I led actually investing in large scale renewable energy projects. So these are large like wind farms, solar farms, um, which ended up being about two and a half billion off their balance sheet and about three and a half gigawatts of projects. Um, but one of the origins for that a little anecdote here, a little origin um, story for that effort was at the time Google had deployed the largest corporate solar array on its rooftops. Um, and you're gonna probably all laugh at this. It was 1.6 megawatts. Um, so, which was, you know, we, we view that as tiny now, but that was the largest corporate solar array. And that made financial sense, um, uh, financial sense and climate sense. And we thought, well, why, why don't we do something much, much bigger? Um, and so we thought with a big balance sheet with tax capacity, meaning we could do tax equity investing or some of the returns come back through tax credits uh, and a desire to do larger impact things. That's what kind of got it started. And we luck, lucky to work at a company that when, someone has an idea like this, um, many companies would say, why would we do that? That's not core to our business. You know, Google at the time would say, why not? If you have a good idea and it's positive economics and it's positive for the world, let's, let's have a shot at it. Um, it's funny that at the time, many people thought, well, this is only something that Google can do, you know, this big investing and it, it must be driven by their desire to help climate and it probably doesn't make economic sense. But I, what I would say is um, these, these investments that I did when I was at Google made cl clearly had to make economic sense. I mean, we got approval up through the treasurer, the CFO, the founders, the CEO of the board to make these investments, all of whom asked hard questions about the economics. So we were really focused on making attractive investments that could have big impact and ideally help crowd in more capital to the space. That was one of the intentions. Let's actually, you know, show that this can be done. And then no matter how big our effort would be, it was always going to be a blip. Let's see if we can crowd in more. So I'd say that same idea is kind of the, the uh, impetus behind the RISE Fund at TPG, which was let's show that we can do significant investments and in impact companies, deliver good returns, attractive returns. And at the same time, there's always this and thread, show that you can have uh, meaningful, positive impact. So as opposed to my investing at Google, at CBG, these investments are more growth equity investments in the corporates and the companies um, that are each in their own way delivering impact. Um, so when I, you know, I, I, I look at climate and energy, uh, but the Rise Fund is multi-sectoral, sort of education, healthcare, other types of, um, other types of investments. Now, I think we've seen an incredible awakening uh, to both the challenge and the opportunity uh, in climate. So you mentioned, you know, the world has changed and I, I'm a, I, I firmly believe in that. It's always, it's always dangerous to say the world is different now. Um, but I really, and honestly, truly believe it is, um, with the evidence of climate change all around us. I've, you know, I've mentioned this to Susan and others, like it's literally punching you in the face, no matter where you are, whether it's, uh, heat waves or, or, or wildfires or flooding. Um, you know, the biggest heat wave going through India right now, it's just, it's incredible. So it's all around us. That's led to government action, corporate commitments, consumer behavior changing. But importantly, there's also been an advancement in the core technologies, right? The core things that make this possible, solar panels, batteries, et cetera, where the prices have come down, but you now have solutions that are more economic. So the investing that we're doing at TPG is corporate investments, growth equity investments, but this, the opportunity space has gotten a much wider. The attention has gotten a lot stronger. Um, and I think the other fascinating thing here is we're seeing talent now flood into this space massively. Of course, the principled 
you know, young kids graduating from college, you know, taking programs that didn't exist when I went to school, like, oh, a combined policy and engineering degree focused on climate. That'd be fantastic. But it's also the talent that's been very successful in their previous job. Now looking at this, seeing all the attention, seeing the massive problems, seeing the massive challenge, but also the opportunity. And these opportunities uh, are marked in, you know, markets that are not with a billion, you know, not a hundred billion, but literally trillions, you know, across many sectors. So it's, the world has changed. Um, they're seeing a lot of capital flow into this space, but it needs all that capital and more. So it's kind of an exciting time. And I, I've been happy to participate early and then now, um, and as, as everyone else here is. So I'm super excited about it. Yeah, well, that's great. So, you know, as you're deploying capital now within the, the RISE Fund, I think the RISE Fund you know, famously created a, a assessment tools to, to measure and quantify social impact of, of the investments you make. And I'm curious, you know, if you take such a you know kind of comfortable sharing like you know how those tools work and when they're used in the you know pre-investment diligence or internal reporting and then i'll sort of tack on to my own compound question i'm also curious you know beyond the rise fund throughout tpg as you get into the the you know sort of traditional mainstream funds are the same tools being used like like the differentiation there between rise um versus the traditional funds and you know esg i think it, to the topic of this conversation, it's obviously bleeding into PE investments across the board, even those that are, you know, in your, uh, you know, non-impact, you know, ESG related sectors. Yeah, yeah, um, it's a good question. I, this is one of the things that attracted me to join TB in the, TBG in the first place, which is a very thoughtful approach to how to measure this impact. Um, which is important for actually being honest and transparent about what the impact is of those companies that you're investing in. But it's also critically important to the LPs to have a way of communicating what the impact really is for these companies. So um, the shorthand version of what we've done is we've created a, a methodology that results in a number called our impact multiple on our money. Um, and you, people can find information about this as an HBS case that was done on it. And the firm that's now kind of helping to continue to evolve this methodology is why analytics and on their website, they have some uh, notes about evidence-based um, investing. But the shorthand version is it basically accounts for the impact that would come from a company's product or service, whatever it's deploying over our typical hold period with a bunch of nuance there. It includes the breadth of the impact, the depth of the impact. It includes some adjustments to what's the risk of achieving that impact, also the duration of those impacts. So there's a whole, there's a lot of detail behind it, but it basically sums up all that impact. It has uses evidence to show what the actual value of that impact is in terms of dollars. So not just you know uh, a ton of CO2 say, but what's the dollar value of that? Or what's the dollar value in education of an additional year of education for a young girl in India? Like it, there are some studies that have been done to show the value of that. That all ends up being in this numerator, the dollars of impact. And then we ass essentially take our ownership portion of that as what equity portion do we own of the company and divide out by our investment. So in the end, we get to an impact value per dollar that we invest. And we've committed to um, investing above a certain threshold of that dollars of impact per dollar invested. And it's in a language that our LPs can understand just uh, intuitively. It's like a multiple on money, uh, but it's an impact multiple on money. That's in addition to whatever the financial returns would be. Um, it's also with the Rise Climate Fund now, we have a, a, a specialized version of this impact multiple called carbon yield, but it's the same thing. It's how much carbon are you saving per dollar invested? So this is a, you ask, you know, when do we use this? This is a critical part of the diligence um, and the initial assessment of any investment. We, we do our financial diligence right alongside our impact diligence. Those go hand in hand and they're done at the same time and no investment is made unless we're confident that a company can pass the threshold of impact that we've communicated to our LPs. Um, it's something that we, uh, we then continue to work with as we close the deal, we set out some KPIs that we're going to be measuring and continue to measure on a quarterly basis, um, as well as maybe some other supplementary KPIs that may relate to the impact, including some which may be expansions of the current model or expansions of the current business. What are some things that we can do that can find additional levers of impact? And some of these companies have, will have multiple impact pathways, like like a you know home a pay -to go solar company. And, in East Africa could be you know, saving carbon, but it could also be reducing emissions in a household and have health benefits. So there may be multiple impact pathways. We go through each of those. 
Um, so it's a critical piece of our diligence, our identification of opportunities, our diligence, and then post-closing assessment. You also asked about how this relates to ESG. Um, I would say at the very top level, for us, ESG represents in some sense how a company does its business, whereas the impact is focused more on what the business does. Um, so if, if you're thinking just on the environmental part of it, so just the E part of it, it's kind of like footprint compared to handprint. Um, and so I think the ESG part of an assessment for investments is done across all of TPG, not just in our rise and rise climate portfolio. And we have a way of you know, walking through what are the ESG elements, the critical ones. And to Susan's earlier point, governance is an absolutely critical one. It happens to be the one where funds like TPG have the most influence. Uh, we sit on the boards, we can be majority owners. So governance is that's kind of the, 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 the lever that we can pull. So it's a very a critically important one for us. Um, we have had major efforts over the last several years to increase the governance um, capability and to increase the diversity of the boards too. We have a, a number of efforts that have focused on bringing on more diverse board members, started with women, now it's broader than that. Um, we have also made investments, strategic investments or partnerships with um, more minority represented uh, investors and smaller funds. But I'd say this ESG effort kind of goes across the whole portfolio. Um, that is, that's happening on every investment, including rise and rise climate. But the impact piece is really measuring what is the result of that company's product or service. And for our investing, we think about it in a very collinear way. If, if a company's product or service is what delivers the impact, then you can increase that business, you can grow that business. And by doing so, you're also growing the impact. So we very much uh, focus on collinear investments, ones where the company itself is delivering that impact through its product or service and therefore growth of the company is growth of the impact. So hopefully that answers the question. Yeah, no, that's that's great and fascinating. And I guess, you know, uh, Faisal, maybe turning to the ERM, obviously sees, you know, sees this in a number of players in the market of, of you know, your perspective on kind of the same sort of uh, issues around ESG performance metrics and tracking and, and how diligence and, and the entire exercise has shifted uh, in the recent years. Yeah, no, happy to provide that perspective. So, I mean, firstly, I mean, Rick laid out really well, especially the definition part of the metrics, because it's very important to get that right up front and then have a methodology in place that can be applied, uh, you know, across the whole fund. So, one, you have the ability to bubble up metrics from individual assets and then the ability to look across uh, a portfolio in a meaningful way where compares, you know, where it's, it's comparable and useful uh, in information, right? So, uh, we, I mean, a lot of our work is around, you know, defining those metrics. I won't go into that because I think Rick described that really well. Uh, I mean, the other aspect is just, again, now operationalizing, um, you know, the, 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 the collection of this information. Again, it could be a large portfolio. We're seeing more and more, uh, you know, leaning on, uh, you know, the financial reporting infrastructure because you're looking to get this information in a consistent manner uh, in, at speed. Uh, and of a high quality, um, you know, not just to use to make your decisions now, but also to uh, to report out, uh, you know, either to, you know, privately to uh, like LPs or in, in some cases publicly as well. So, uh, you know, that part of it, uh, increasing focus on that. And we, you know, we're working quite extensively on, on tools around that. Um, also, there's an increasing um, sort of... Uh, increasing number of software providers who are providing solutions. Again, this is around now the aggregation of, of this collection and aggregation and reporting of this information. And then with the ability to uh, you know, provide some pretty useful reporting and dashboards that again can, you know, can be quite useful for decision-making. So certainly seeing um, you know, a lot of uh, sort of activity, investment and development in, 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 that, in, in that space. Uh, and we were certainly involved with, 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 with a lot of that uh, ourselves. One last thing to mention is, uh, and I think Rick mentioned this already, but you know, it's, it's the focus on value creation very early, even before the diligence stage, you know, when you're, you're doing your pre-screening uh, to not just look at risk, but you know, value creation uh, sort of opportunities as well. And then that's very much part of you know, the decision at, at deal time, even for non-impact investments, right? So we were certainly seeing uh, a, a, lot of, a lot more focus and diligence uh, you know, on that uh, you know, very early on um, as, 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 as well. Jason, did you have anything to add on that? I'm not sure. No, um, so I think uh, 
you know, Faisal and, and Rick have actually uh, highlighted really well. I just want to kind of focus again on um, on um, the tools uh, which are available, simply because many people are in the different stages of their ES EGG journey. Um, as Susan mentioned, we want to start go deep and start small with a few uh, key metrics. Um, but also, you know, people are not alone in that. Um, they can do two things. One, they can leverage technology uh, to help them. And that's, in, in, that's in, across different ways, right? It's um, data gathering itself or data reporting. Um, and also leveraging outside resources, whether there's expert networks, um, outside vendors, or even uh, uh, law firms to be able to keep track of what's really happening. So uh, it's a combination of building capacity uh, and leveraging resources, and but that includes technology or um, uh, external vendors. Uh, but the overarching thing around all of this, Patrick, is actually to have an appropriate governance process, right? If you look in the even, and I'm going to leverage what uh, the TCFD says, the first thing that he says to have a proper governance process, strategy, risk management, and then matrix uh, to measure progress. I think that kind of four pillars uh, is essential. Uh, for the ESG reporting journey and management of things, right? It sets things in context and prevents uh, things from going in too soon, right? It's not small, but you got to have a plan. Yeah, yeah, no, it makes a lot of sense. I think, you know, you, Jason, you had mentioned in the beginning, like you come from the legal, the legal side of things at Tomasic. And so I'm curious, you know, how are you, or, or, or Tomasic, how are you seeing others in the industry tracking all the various benchmarks that are being adopted? Um, with respect to this, you know, again, from that legal regulatory side and, and what are you seeing funds do in terms of, you know, what, what, what is the new baseline or how do we determine uh, as various benchmarks come out, you know, what, what should be the baseline from a legal and regulatory perspective here? Yeah, so Patrick, I think we, you know, I look at it and I, I can divide what's coming out in the ESG reporting and expectation space into four buckets. Uh, first, it's the global goals and principles, you know, things like PRI and so on. Then you have the reporting frameworks, uh, FASB, ISB, uh, GRI. Look at then also at the ESG rating indices. And lastly, um, the regulations. Um, in, in some respects, right, the regulations, the table stakes is the easiest thing because if you want to carry on the business in a safe and sound manner, you have to comply. Um, and we look at it and very much as part of the overall um, rec change management process, right? Which, really involves three steps. One is the horizon scanning, see what's coming around the corner. And that provides an opportunity for people actually to um, engage in some sort of advocacy or lobbying, uh, whether that's individually or to trade associations. Um, and I think you'll see in the ESG space more so than anything else, where there is actually a lot of outreach from the regulators on pers perspective uh, regulations coming out. It's not something that happens overnight. Um, so it's a second point is also on the intake process, where you actually look at regulations which have been passed and then analyze the impact and see what's the effect on the organization. And the third part um, is actually oper operationalizing the the changes. Now, um, how do you ensure that on a day-to-day -day basis, you're in compliance, whether your policies, procedures need to change, uh, you, do you need to do um, training. Um, and so it's a, a holistic approach to managing uh, the RECs coming out in the ESG space. At the heart of it is actually embedding a governance process to deal with these changes. And I think key to that is to um, ensuring this internal accountability uh, on how the work um, is spread. So that's the, the best way. Again, um, for organizations in different sizes, um, there are tools you can uh, assist you in uh, managing this, uh, will assist you in horizon scanning um, and regulatory life cycle management. And also this ability to leverage you know, experts uh, to help you manage the whole process. But again, key to as I mentioned just a minute ago, um, Patrick, it's the need to have an appropriate governance process to deal with these uh, changes. Um, so that's um, going to be, again, the table stakes as you talk about um, regulations coming out. Now, if, again, the point is that regulations themselves sometimes uh, trail the expectations or other standards uh, which are in the market. So, uh, you know, if you look at it, there's, uh, I, there's kind of alphabet soup of different types of regulations. I mentioned some of them, SASB, ESB, and so on, right? Um, now, and that's also has, you know, it's, alphabet soup is a term that is used uh, and synonymous with ESG reporting and used derogatively. But I actually think there's a method that, just, just let me explain. So what is the purpose of the reporting, actually? It's to provide summaries of uh, 
quality with a quantitative performance, right? Together with some performance analysis measured against a certain metrics, in this case, ESG. So you have different sorts of standards out there, but they have different objectives. Um, it's also the, the contributors to the alphabet soup uh, one, they are um, standards to reflect a certain of the objectives or certain uh, issues that they're concerned about. So if you're a fund, if you're an entity trying to deal with these non-regulatory um, standards, the point is also to, to look and understand what narrative you're trying to uh, uh, present, uh, which stakeholders are you trying to communicate with and what insights do you want to give? So if you are looking um, as a company to uh, give some comfort to your investors or to increase your investor base, then maybe you look at it. If you have a multi-stakeholder view on things, RI. If you're a bank looking at the impact and you want to present the impact of your uh, financing activities or capital markets activities, maybe PCAF is the way to go. Uh, when you're trying to increase your investor base for your debt and equity, uh, maybe you need to tool up to get into the ESG index or to issue your bonds and your funds with the uh, ICMA uh, green bond rules. So again, it's... Um, Horses for courses, so you know, I, to, to stretch the alphabet soup analogy, uh, it's different taste. People have, have, have you, you need to put different ingredients uh, to suit the taste of the different folks. I think, and I, I'll just add, I think, you know, at Jason's point, we've all made the point, I think some funds are making asset managers are making the mistake of putting this just in the compliance bucket. And really the point that you need to have a good governance strategy. Some of it is compliance because there's now regulation, like there was FCPA, increasingly human rights climate. So, but a lot of it has to do with, with managing and actually investing and deal and driving value, you know, as, as Andrew and Rick um, said. So I, I, yeah, just wanted to clarify that before Madeline goes. Yeah, I was just saying, you know, Madeline is a kind of going to the alphabet soup, like a European based fund. And now there's new reporting, reporting requirements under SFDR. Um, for years, I'm just curious, you know, kind of your thoughts or reactions on, on everything which Jason was describing and how generation, you know, addresses the same, the same myriad of requirements and, and how to navigate it and what tools to use. Yeah, but I, massive question and, and obviously many, many work streams generally around that. Um, I think look, Generation is one of the, the oldest uh, and largest sustainable investing firms, so founded in 2004. So I think having Generation been founded almost with the idea of defining sustainable investing and proving out that thesis, why that matters, why there should be a market in that. Um, our, you know, SFDR is is welcome in the sense of it's almost bringing kind of a, a clarified definition of what sustainable investing would and should mean and then providing clear almost levels of classification around that. Um, I mean, we did do the work and I recommend absolutely anyone going through this, you have to do the gap analysis on what are you doing today, uh, internal processes around that and or start to enshrine in our legal documentation. And as part of that, also what type of technical, like we're calling it effectively our ESG data stack um, or tooling stack, do we want to put in place so that we can achieve what we want to achieve without also seeing a spike in kind of cost and, and resources needed? A um, couple of points on that. So I think at a high level, we sort of feel we were at a 94% there, I think. I'll speak from the perspective of our growth strategy. Uh, with SFDR and our growth strategy, our um, new fund will be Article 9 classified. So we're speaking from that perspective. Um, there, probably the greatest question was just around how SFDR, uh, what they require in terms of measurements and the PAIs and making sure we map around our metrics. There's a review of our metrics framework. And... Uh, ensuring that we've incorporated what we want to see, what regulators want to see, refreshing our views on that. Uh, on the tooling side, that's been interesting. I think what we're seeing and what we're probably going to expect to see is portfolio monitoring tooling, your basic stack, carrying the bulk of the ESG data system of record uh, responsibility, um, there are a number of different providers out there, but we're we're looking at using, as it were, kind of an innovative but pure play portfolio monitoring system to handle most of our ESG data as well. 
Um, there are still some outstanding questions for us on what we recommend if we do to our portfolio companies to have their own approach to system of record because it has to kind of start at the portfolio company level. So there's that going on. And then on the legal side, um, we have actually, I mean, on the call, we've, we've worked with Sue directly in reviewing and updating our draft side letter language, but then where possible, it goes directly into the SPA to formally state what our intentions are with the fund, engage the company in uh, high level representation. Yes, we also agree we're doing that. Um, ensure that we get information rights if there are any material changes, deviations to that, um, gain alignment on putting in place an ESG reporting framework, um, and also embed uh, light attached commitments to making improvements on an annual basis and working with us on that. So. That's been really exciting for us because there was a good chance for us to say, okay, this is going in your legals. Exactly how do we want to communicate this and synthesize what is actually most important for us on a strategic level? And, you know, we kind of have to thank regulation for that, actually, for pushing, pushing us forward to think about doing that. But it's something that certainly we could have done before. That's great. Um, you know, Faisal, ERM is the driver of, ESG integration strategy across let's say trying to you know help help uh, folks uh, you know navigate everything we've just talked about. Can you maybe delve into a little bit uh, of that from your perspective, and then sort of you know practical best practices that you've seen you know from uh, ESG investment integration? Sure, sure, happy to. Uh, I mean, so firstly, I mean you know we've talked a lot about some of the increasing you know expectations and requirements, right? And the the, the number of stakeholders has has widened uh, as as well, right? So all that's uh, you know affecting uh, you know what what firms or funds need to define um, sort of as their target maturity for ESG, if you will. Uh, so we, you know, that's usually where we start with clients is to say, hey, where are you at now? Uh, what are your current stakeholder expectations and where do you see them going? And based on that, you know, define sort of an aspiration level of maturity. And then uh, what we've developed also is some key attributes of what we call an ESG operating model. So what will it take to, um, you know, sort of operationalize, uh, you know, ESG through the in in investment process? And the way we look at that is from a lens of policy, a lens of process, a lens of data, and then to the extent of automation is viable uh, in the short and long term. And then from that, we would construct uh, essentially a roadmap or a journey uh, for you know, getting you know, clients from point A to point B, uh, including reporting. So a lot of that is to do with you know, acknowledging in sometimes fairly public ways of where people are at with their with their with their maturity and saying hey in, in one year and three years this is where we expect to get to and uh, this is the types of policies we're implementing these are the this is a process uh, view of how this is going to work in our environment uh, and then over time to to sort of automate and digitize you know some of these processes so again very much a function of where you're at very much a function of what your stakeholders expect. And recognizing that we're in an environment where those expectations keep keep going up all the time, right? So it's an it's an evolving thing. Uh, and then you know, and then also we do a lot of you know reporting. I mean, not just around metrics, but around this journey as well. So so the you know, and and with case studies, and you know, so we're doing more and more of that. And we feel that really helps authentically put out you know to all your stakeholders what you're doing. Uh, and and how you know whether it's measuring impact, whether it's uh, you know it's sort of just diligence in in your processes. That that whole comprehensive story we feel is is quite is quite effective and useful to to stakeholders. So that's a large part of you know the the work that that we do. Um, and you know we, doesn't mean we do all of this for every client, but you know everyone's in a different place and with different needs. So we you know there's some of this going on at a very very large number of clients as we speak. Got it. Um, and, and Suze, maybe just uh, one last more technical question for you. We talked about it a little bit at the beginning, but kind of, you know, in a, a further step in the ESG uh, journey are these different corporate forms that, that, that have gained much more interest and much more level of adoption. So I was wondering if, you know, you could speak a little bit to uh, the increased interest in using, utilizing those forms, kind of, you know, what they are and how they, how they help focus on, on ESG and, and the duties associated with them. 
Well, I'll, I'll go back to what Rick said. I, I, there has been a sea change. I mean, there are a bunch of us who've been in the sector for what seems like, well, it has been decades. It is fundamentally different now and it is, it is changing very rapidly. Um, I think what we've all been dancing around is really accountability. So, um, you know, you know, you're, you're now it used to be five years ago you, as a fund, as an asset manager, put out a color glossy, you save jobs, you reduce carbon, you, you know, you helped, you know, poor people in Africa. Yay. Now, you know, we're in a whole new world and increasingly. And then obviously with the SEC rules, really having, you know, qualified independent third parties who are verifying. I, you know, thinking about corporate form is a different way. Uh, of of that accountability because a lot of the things in ESG you know look at what Rick did at Google look at what you know Andrew was doing for years at Generate before they converted you can do a lot of these things the the new corporate forms in the U S and and globally are you're required to and you can be sued by your shareholders if you don't so it really is. You know, reporting is one uh, reporting and verification is one element of accountability. These new corporate forms, and I I was drafting the first one, which we introduced, you know, in two thousand and seven, in California. You know, and I would talk to people like Rick for an hour about the power of shifting fiduciary duties, and they would wander away from me dazed. You know, now people want to talk about it, and there are nineteen publicly traded PBCs. So we have we now are actually have real market data for if you and just just a level set a B Corp is just a certification. Underlying corporate forms are very different in the U.S. state by state, and there are many, many jurisdictions like Singapore and um, and the U.K. Just because those folks are on the phone, that also have versions of this. But we're talking about where you have a shift of fiduciary duty. Boards and management have a fiduciary duty to and a, a clearly articulated public benefit or ESG um, factor. So. Benefit Corporation, different state by state. The PBC and the SBC, um, the PBC being Delaware, is is gotten the most traction. Interestingly, it has been used at at kind of the top level as a sweet pill. So you know there are folks who think, in fact, if Twitter had offered to its shareholders to convert into a PBC, it could have turned down um, Elon Musk's offer, and it could have. So um, it is it is it is being used for more than just ESG purposes, but that's that's where we are, and it is it's another tool like the documentation, like the the disclosure that we've been talking about. Well, thank you, everybody. I think maybe one one last question uh, here for our last couple of minutes, and I'll put to to everybody just again with the thing. So let's say you're a fund who's you know kind of on the the beginning edge of of, of their of ESG and, and grappling with all of this. Maybe just you know something from everybody in terms of advice, practical advice or best practice to adopt or, you know, a lesson learned, uh, you know, something to avoid early um, that, that, that just might be helpful for the broader audience. And I'll just leave it open. And I'll start just by giving the suggestion that I had at the big, in our pre-call. If you are investing, if you're an investor and you're investing in a company for climate, for their emission reduction, you really need to think about tools in the investment documents. If they decide to take that technology and no longer focus on climate, you know, how either including an economic penalty, including some economic rewards of the type from the sustainability linked bonds or actually having a redemption feature. So thinking the world is gonna to continue to evolve very, very quickly. So what do you do as the portfolio company evolves? Popcorn, Madeline. Um, excellent point, actually. Um, look, I think from our perspective as the portfolio company is evolving, you have to just simply engage and maintain that ongoing conversation. Um, we also look to put in place, um, I think when we, when we're starting, uh, the engagement with the portfolio company is even almost upfront clarifying what we mean by we take a view of sort of what's system positive approach and therefore what level of measurement, what level of management that we want to see and also why is that meaningful? Um, and then integrate that both into board reporting and also our ongoing reporting as well as conversations that are coming both for myself and the deal partners. So it maintains a, a level of feedback and um, 
uh, allows to ensure that we're, we're on top of the entire process and can continue to respond and adjust as things go on. One, one just a suggestion I have, I'm not sure if it's a tool specifically, but it's, <clears throat> it's an attitude, um, which is being a little bit humble about this. There's a lot of um, intentionality here, but to be honest, to be brutally honest, the data is still really rough um, for trying to assess scope three emissions. And, and do you hold a, a company responsible for their scope three emissions, you know, when it involves supply chain, which they have very little visibility to, getting better visibility, so that's better, or usage of their device where it's in a consumer's hands. And you've kind of lost control of it. Um, there's mitigants to both of those, but I would just say, um, be a little bit humble. The, the measurement and data around this will evolve and will get better. Um, there's no, I mean, I haven't seen a silver bullet answer. Like this is definitely the, the way to go. Um, so you have to be a little bit flexible that the, the world's gonna continue to change and evolve and get better. So uh, I wouldn't, don't think that you have, don't look for the ultimate solution today. Look for something that's gonna um, be a good solution now. And I think Jason mentioned, have the ability to build capacity to understand where these things are going and, and move with them and be helpful along that path if you can. Um, Patrick, from my perspective, um, it's um, I, I would just give this piece of advice um, to folks who are starting on their ESG journey, is to embed ESG in their business ops and their BAU. Um, don't look at it as something which is separate. No, just a uh, spoiler alert, there'll never be enough ESG prefects in, the, in an organization to check, right? The, the best way we can hope is everyone becomes their own ESG officer and that's um, uh, embedded in the culture of the company itself to focus on ESG, right? Uh, you can have a core group sending out policies, being thought leaders and doing the horizon scanning, but really you need to permeate uh, ESG throughout the entire organization in hiring uh, decisions, how you do compensation, uh, where you invest your money, what vendors you engage in and so on, right? So it has to be embedded. And that, that would be something to think about, not ESG as a sidecar, but actually something with this call to your organization. I, I would agree very much with what Rick and, and Jason just said and, and only add that, um, you know, in, in, in the vein of, of being humble and embedding a lot of this, um, you know, there, there's a lot that... Uh, we need to accomplish from an environmental, social, and governance perspective. And, you know, we need to go after the messier parts, the dirtier parts of the economy to pick on the E side for a front um, or for a minute. So, you know, making sure that you're, you're not setting yourself up to dissuade, you know, that activity to dissuade the decarbonization of the harder parts of the economy to do that for, I think is, is important as well. And maybe just one quick thing to add is, you know, just along the journey, both from a process improvement or from a data improvement standpoint, is just to stay quite as authentic as you can, you know, not oversell your ESG story, especially in the context of, you know, the, the, there's so much scrutiny now on, on information. I think the, the days of, you know, broad statements about impact, uh, you know, those, the, you know it's, it's very dangerous to do that. So we, we certainly caution our clients about being, being precise about what, what you have done, can do, and are going to do, but not to blur the lines between, between those uh, at, at this moment in time. Yeah, we talked about the fact that the SEC has at least 20 open investigations mm -hmm. on ES ESG. Mm -hmm. uh, that was in the compliance. This is value. Right. They, you know. <laughs> Go ahead, Patrick. Uh, well, look, I, thank you. Uh, first of all, all of, all of you have been really great. As somebody who's uh, historically just a simple deal guy, I continue to, uh, to learn a ton in this space. And, and you know, from my perspective, about every deal now, it's all become you know, very integrated uh, uh, with every fund and, and no matter what the, what the target is. And so it's incredibly important that it's only going to get uh, more and more involved. And so again, want to thank each of you for taking your time out to join us. Thank you for uh, all of the, uh, the audience for listening as well. Um, we'll say, I hope everybody can join us. Our next uh, webinar, we focus on ESG and, and private equity in Latin America uh, in June. So look out for the details on that. And otherwise, I hope everybody enjoys the rest of the day and stays uh, safe and healthy. Thank you.